Hello and welcome. I'm Professor Adam Thompson, and this is the introduction to the endocrine system. When we talk about endocrinology, uh, there's a lot of similarities with neurology. You know, the, uh, when you're talking about neurology, you're talking about the brain and the spinal cord and all the nerves in between that kind of send signals via neurotransmitters. Well, with the endocrine system, you still have uh, brains, so to speak, but they use glands. The endocrine system uses glands. Uh, some of those are located near the brain, like uh, your pituitary gland, right? Um, and, and these glands send off hormones or, or uh, stimulation of hormones, right? Uh, so you'll have hormones that stimulate other hormones. Uh, and, and, and the difference is that hormones are, are they're very similar to neurotransmitters, but they react a little bit slower, right? Uh, so the endocrine system influences almost every cell, organ, and function of the body. Uh, patients with an endocrine disorder often have a broad range of signs and symptoms, and it's going to take thorough assessment and immediate treatment uh, to prevent a life-threatening emergency. So the endocrine system is responsible for the control and the regulation of all the systems in the body. A disease of the endocrine system occurs when your normal cell signaling is interrupted, very similar to diseases with uh, the neurological system. Um, you know, you have uh, nerve signaling that can be interrupted, and the, you'll ha have some really bad neurological disorder. Um, this can happen with cell signaling as well, and that's when you have an endocrinological disorder. Uh, and components of the endocrine system are the hypothalamus, the pineal gland, pituitary gland, thyroid gland, the thymus gland, your parathyroid gland, and your adrenal glands, and you even have organs that are part of the endocrine system, such as your pancreas and your gonads. Hormones are chemical messengers that are secreted into the bloodstream by the endocrine glands. So picture hormones as kind of like the neurotransmitters of the endocrine system. So neurotransmitters are what send signals when you're talking about the brain and spinal cord, but when you're talking about the endocrine system and glands, Hormones are those chemical messengers. Again, they're not as fast as neurotransmitters, but the, the actions can be longer lasting. Hormones circulate throughout the body uh, and target organs to maintain homeostasis. That's the body's common uh, want is to maintain that balance or that homeostasis. First up, we have the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is a small region of the brain that contains several control centers for body functions and emotions. It's the primary link between the endocrine system and the nervous system. So we kept talking about the neurological uh, disorders and how things uh, work neurologically within the nervous system. The endocrine system has a connection to that nervous system known as the hypothalamus. It produces regulatory hormones co controlling the release of hormones by the pituitary gland. So that pituitary gland, again, is that it's that representative, you know, that, that was elected by the endocrine system to go to Congress, you know, the brain, and uh, receive signals uh, from the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland are intimately related and work uh, through the vascular system uh, synergistically, if you will. So the other half of that relationship is the pituitary gland. The hypothalamus and the pituitary gland, they work very closely together. And six hormones are secreted by this pituitary gland, and they control the activity of other endocrine glands. So a lot of hormones are known as stimulating hormones. They don't necessarily act directly on an organ or a target organ, but they stimulate another hormone that does. And the reason for that is because the brain might take the initial uh, signal, right? And it needs to, you know, that, so the, the, the neurovascular system needs to send it over to the endocrine system. And it'll say, hey, something's happening over yonder. Can you send a, a signal there to get things started? And then the pituitary gland will take that information from the hypothalamus and send a stimulating hormone. And then the actual target uh, uh, organ hormone will, will be secreted. And whatever action need, that needs to occur will occur. I know I'm speaking very generally, so it's kind of confusing. Uh, but we'll get to the more specific hormones and the things that happen within the body in this lecture. So those are known as uh, tropic hormones. So you got your adrenocotropic hormone, I'm sure you've heard of, and your growth hormone. And there are two other hormones uh, that control other body functions, such as ADH and oxytocin. ADH, of course, is antidiuretic hormone. Super important when talking about the endocrine system is an understanding of the thyroid gland. Thyroid hormones affect the metabolism. 
uh, and they're secreted in response to stimulation of the thyroid gland by the anterior pituitary gland. Again, that's our connection to the brain, the anterior pituitary gland, uh, specifically uh, sends signals to that thyroid gland. It secretes thyroxin when the body's metabolic rate decreases. So the thyroid gland secretes thyroxin in response to a decreased metabolic rate, and it's known as the body's major metabolic hormone. It stimulates energy production in cells, and it cannot be produced without the proper level of iodine intake. So you don't want to have too low of iodine. That's why we have iodine in our salt to have a nice, healthy, functioning thyroid gland. The lack of thyroxine diminishes uh, physical and mental growth. So it's, it's pretty bad if you don't have a nice, healthy thyroid gland. And production is regulated by a negative feedback mechanism. In addition to thyroxine, the thyroid gland will secrete calcitonin. Uh, calcitonin helps maintain your calcium levels in the blood. And whenever you think of calcium, of course, you're thinking of your bones, right? Strong bones require calcium. So, of course, if you have a poorly functioning uh, thyroid that doesn't uh, you know, produce enough uh, calcitonin, you could have a bone density issue. Uh, it stimulates that bone building cell to absorb excess calcium, and it also stimulates the kidneys to absorb and excrete excess calcium. Of course, of course you have to eliminate it at some point. Next up, we have the parathyroid glands. And as the name kind of uh, insinuates, the, the parathyroid glands are next to or, or around the thyroid. Uh, you know, there's four uh, kind of spots on the thyroid that, that are, consist of the parathyroid glands. And they assist in the regulation of calcium, most, much like calcitonin does. And then the parathyroid hormone, it acts as an antagonist to calcitonin. So it's that opposite. You know, everything has to maintain a homeostasis. It's secreted when uh, the, your calcium blood levels are low. So as your calcium blood levels low, uh, your calcitonin, which normally helps with the reuptake of calcium in the bones and the excretion, excretion of calcium from the kidneys like we talked about, right? Well, if your calcium levels are low, you don't want that to happen. So your parathyroid hormone will counteract that calcitonin so you don't excrete the excess calcium or absorb it into the bones. It's secreted... As I said, when calcium blood levels are low, it stimulates bone dissolving cells to break down bone and release calcium into the bloodstream. So remember, hypocalcemia uh, will cause this breakdown of bone, and this is how it happens by the parathyroid hormone. Uh, it decreases the amount of calcium release in the urine. So again, by stopping calcitonin, you stop the excretion via the kidneys of calcium. Next up, we have the thymus gland, and this gland simply helps the immune system identify and destroy foreign intruders. Uh, one of the major uh, endocrine organs is the pancreas, which is a digestive gland, and it's considered both endocrine and exocrine uh, as a gland. And the exocrine component secretes digestive enzymes into the duodenum via the pancreatic duct. Okay, if you look at this image here, you can see that this is the, uh, the pancreas, and it's kind of a transection of the, of the pancreas. You see that pancreatic duct on the inside, these islets of Langerhans, that's where your hormones come from, such as insulin, right? Uh, and these pancreatic enzymes help with digestion. So the endocrine component of the pancreas is comprised of those islets of Langerhans. And those are like cell groups within the pancreas, and they act like an organ within the organ. Uh, it has alpha cells, beta cells, delta cells. The alpha cells will secrete glucagon, which, which helps with uh, glycolysis. Uh, beta cells secrete insulin, also required for the breakdown of uh, glucose. Um, delta cells secrete uh, somatostatin. And somatostatin is uh, important because it's also from the hypothalamus, which inhibits the pituitary gland secretion of growth hormone. Uh, it's an inhibitor of growth hormone secretion. But when it's in the pancreas, uh, it inhibits the secretion of other pancreatic hormones, such as insulin and glucagon. So again, you're seeing that homeostasis because the beta cells will you know, secrete this insulin and the alpha cells secrete glucagon, and then the somatostatin will kind of counterbalance the two. Uh, it's very interesting how the body's constantly got this state of homeostasis built in. Probably one of the most well-known functions of the endocrine system 
is the regulation of your blood glucose. All right, and when blood glucose levels uh, fall, glucagon is secreted by the pancreas, uh, those islets of Langerhans, right? Uh, the alpha cells within there, to be most specific, and the glucagon is secreted to raise your blood glucose. So it stimulates the liver, which actually changes glycogen because glycogen is stored in the liver, and that glycogen will, will break down into sugar and it will secrete it into the bloodstream. So that's what glucagon does. It doesn't immediately affect the blood sugar by going directly in the blood. Glucagon is not sugar. It does not equate that way. But glucagon, again, acts as a hormone to tell another organ, the liver, to break down glycogen and convert that into sugar. It's, a, it's an interesting process. Fascinating, really. And, and when blood glucose levels rise, insulin is secreted. So again, we have a homeostasis. Here's another balance. Your insulin will be secreted. It transports glucose into the cells because alone, glucose won't get into those cells. It needs, again, another hormone known as insulin uh, to get in there. It's like the key that opens the lock, all right? That's how you want to picture insulin. It's the key that opens the lock. It stimulates the liver to take in more glucose and to store it, again, as glycogen for later use. So when your blood sugar levels rise, now you can start storing it for later use. And when it drops, you'll have that glycogen uh, ready to be stimulated by glucose or uh, glucagon and created glucose to raise your blood sugar. Uh, the only hormone that decreases the blood glucose levels in the body endogenously is insulin. Next up we have the adrenal glands. Adrenal might sound familiar like adrenaline and we'll get there, we'll talk about it because that's where it comes from. But the adrenal glands, they're located uh, just superiorly to the kidneys, right? Each kidney has an adrenal gland that kind of sits right on top. They're triangular shaped, kind of like a pyramid that sits on top of the kidneys. And they're divided into two distinct sections the adrenal cortex and the adrenal medulla, so the outside and the inside of the adrenal gland. The adrenal cortex completely surrounds the inner adrenal medulla, and that adrenal cortex will secrete aldosterone. If you're familiar with the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone uh, system, uh, then you know what aldosterone does. It responds to a drop in blood pressure or a decrease in sodium or increase in potassium, and what aldosterone does is it tells the kidneys to stop getting rid of sodium because where sodium goes, water follows, right? And if we stop eliminating sodium, we're going to maintain or retain fluids in the body, which will hopefully bring up your overall volume, which will hopefully increase your blood pressure. So that's what aldosterone does in response to a decreased blood pressure. The adrenal cortex will uh, sense that decrease in blood pressure and release aldosterone to reuptake sodium. So that's what it does. It stimulates the kidneys to reabsorb sodium from the urine and excrete potassium when needed. Uh, when stimulated by the hypothalamus, the adrenal medulla actually secretes small amounts of norepinephrine and large amounts of epinephrine. That's your adrenaline. Epinephrine is adrenaline. Norepinephrine is noradrenaline. So when the hypothalamus uh, is stimulating the adrenal medulla, that's what's released, norepinephrine and epinephrine. And norepinephrine raises blood pressure by causing contraction of smooth muscle that lines the arterioles and relaxation of smooth muscle that lines the bronchioles. So those are your alpha beta effects. And then epinephrine stimulates sympathomimetic nervous system or the symp sympathetic nervous system because it is a sympathomimetic. Uh, it, it stimulates the sympathetic nervous system receptors and stimulates the liver to convert glycogen to glucose. Remember, we, we know that if we have increased sugar in the body, that's where energy is created. So epinephrine can create energy by converting glycogen to glucose all right, within the liver for use as energy in the cells. The result is increased levels of oxygen and glucose in the, uh, in the blood and faster circulation of blood to the brain, heart, and muscles. And when are these stimulated? So the sympathetic nervous system, we know from, uh, you know, if, if you know anything about the peripheral nervous system, the autonomic nervous system, uh, what happens when the sympathetic nervous system is stimulated? Well, you get a, that fight or flight response, an increased heart rate, increase in blood pressure, increase in respirations, because we're in this mode of survival. And a lot of times it's stimulated via shock. So you'll have a, you know, bleeding or decrease in volume or, or cardiogenic shock or some form of hypoperfusion that will tell the body, hey, 
let's kick that sympathetic nervous system into gear and epinephrine, norepinephrine will be dumped into the bloodstream, both as neurotransmitters and as hormones. And that's very interesting about these. Um, and as a, a hormone, it'll actually stimulate the, uh, uh, the glycogen to become glucose and, f and an increased level of oxygen in the blood. As a neurotransmitter, it tells the heart to pick up its heart rate. Um, again, as a hormone, you're constricting the blood vessels. All of these things happen in conjunction, both, uh, you know, so, some stimulating a little bit faster than others. We know that neurotransmitters are a little bit quicker than hormones, but both work very synergistically to kind of counteract the effect of shock and hypoperfusion. Next up in the endocrine system, we have the gonads. The primary function of the gonads is to promote sexual maturation and fulfill the reproductive needs, right? They are known as testes in men, and they produce hormones called uh, androgens, they regulate changes associated with puberty, and the most important uh, hormone uh, is testosterone when we're talking about the testes. In females, the gonads are, of course, known as the ovaries, ovaries, and the ovaries secrete two hormones uh, in particular, estrogen and progesterone. Those are known as the female hormones, right? Testosterone in men, estrogen and progesterone in, in, in women, and although that, you know, men can have estrogen, women can have testosterone, However, predominantly, much more dominant in their known genders. Estrogen signals the anterior pituitary gland to secrete LH, which is known as luteinizing hormone. And this is secreted when an egg is developing into an ovarian follicle. Both progesterone and uh, estrogen assist in the regulation of the menstrual cycle. Um, and at puberty, estrogen actually supports the development of the secondary sex characteristics, while progesterone prepares the uterus for the implementation or implantation of a fertilized egg. Uh, 